Pleasant good evening to everyone, and we want to say welcome once more to our midweek prayer and study hour here at Wellington SBA. We want to thank the good Lord for his goodness and his mercies towards us, for sparing our lives to see once more another, another midweek prayer service. To those who have just logged on, whether you're viewing us via Facebook, <coughs> YouTube, um, wherever you are at this time, whether you're in Europe, Africa, Asia, wherever you are at this time, even you're at, your, at your home, maybe at the park, maybe driving home, listening, we say welcome and we hope and pray that as you reflect over the, the day, that the good Lord and his mercies had been with you and he has kept you thus far. We have so much to be thankful for and tonight we have come to give thanks and to give praise to our mighty God for his bountiful blessings towards us, undeserving though we may be. The Bible says that the good Lord, he makes the sun to rise both on the just and on the unjust. Tonight, friends, we have come to give thanks and we have come to use this platform as a means of encouragement to encourage you as, you, as, you, as you're going through life and the struggles that may be confronting you in your walk with Jesus, that all is not lost. Where there's life, there is still hope. Let's not give up on Jesus because he has not given up on you. We believe that your circumstances will not get the best of you, that if you continue to cling to God's unchanging hand, that by and by you will gain the victory. You shall live, said David, and shall not die. You shall live to declare the words and the works of Almighty God. Friends, we want to encourage you guys, if you have not, to make full use of the Three Angels Voice of Prayer Hope Ministries. It is a ministry that is spearheaded by one of our very own um, sister, um, Evans. Sister Evans. <laughs> Pardon me, Sister Evans. And one thing I can say about Sister Evans, and I've known her for many years now, that she is a woman of prayer. And the Lord birthed this in her and and we thank God for this ministry. It's a very live, a very vibrant, a very active ministry that helps to um, <clears throat> ease the burden in regards to prayer. And we hope that you are taking, making use of it. Listen, you need not go through life alone. And sometimes we have burdens, we have problems, we have sorrows that no human hand can heal or help. There is a God and we have created this platform whereby you can seek to ease that burden. Um, if you do have a prayer request, please dial in at 305-676-4113. And we are discreet. We take these things to God and we intercede on your behalf that God will have his, 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 his divine will and way in whatever situation you are going through. The times of operation, if you'd like to log on in the morning, the number is 561-440-6854. They are live 5 a.m. Sundays through Saturdays midday 12 p.m. Sundays through Fridays and evening Mondays 7, 7 p.m. Mondays and Thursdays and you can lift your voices in testimony in song in praise in exhortation in magnifying the name of the Lord friends if you have not we want to do encourage you guys to do subscribe to the church's channel go to YouTube type Wellington SDA in click that subscription button because as we go live every week you'll be notified with a notification and while you're in that same zone please do remember to reach out and subscribe to my personal channel type my name in carlton not and click that subscription button friends you know we, we 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 are here to help this is a teaching ministry that we have created by the grace of god and if you'd like to receive the study guides for this particular series or to be added to the church's mailing list do reach out to us email us at info at wellingtonsda.com or c.not at the final movements.com and we will do our very best one to add you to our mailing list two to get these lessons these study guides out to you in a timely in a timely manner friends as we look to the left to the right we are confronted by problems and as our faces differ so do the struggle and the struggle is real let no one deceive you said mrs white that to overcome the devil is an, ev is a, is an, is an easy thing. Even Christ who, who overcame was not left unscarred. He was wounded in his side, in his feet, in his arms, on his head. And yea, he even suffered a mortal wound. And so friends, this thing called Christianity is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And Jesus bids us to take it day by day. He says sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. Let's not be burdened, concerned, over anxious about tomorrow because sufficient for the day 
is the evil thereof. Let's just ask God to give us one day at a time, moment by moment, the song says. And tonight, friends, we have come, in the words of Mrs. Spurgeon, to cast the burdens of the present, along with the sins of the past and the fear of the future, upon a God who upholds worlds and who rules in the affairs of men. The songwriter says, Tis the blessed hour of prayer, when our hearts lowly bend, as we gather to Jesus, our Savior and friend, if we come to him in faith, his protection to share. What a balm for the weary, the song says. Oh, how sweet to be there. This chorus says, blessed hour of prayer. Blessed hour of prayer. What a balm for the weary. Oh, how sweet to be there. Charles Spurgeon says, anything that causes us to pray is a blessing. And friends, we are told every difficulty is a call to prayer. And tonight we're going to go into a season of prayer. We're going to cast the burdens of the past, the sins of the present, fear of the future upon the Lord who ever liveth to make it intercession for us. So as I pray and as you plead and as we see our own sweet need, let us reverently bow as we beseech the Lord in prayer. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Our God, our Father, our Maker, our Redeemer, our soon coming King, we approach thy throne of grace and mercy in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Tonight, Lord, we have come with grateful hearts Thanking you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercies. Thanking you, Lord, for the providence, your protection, Lord. Thanking you, Lord, for allowing us to be alive once more. Thanking you, Lord, for providing for us the food that we need, the jobs that we need, the health and the strength that we need, Lord. Even for the trials that help us to draw us nearer to you. We thank you, Lord, that you have not left us unto ourselves. That you have given us your Holy Spirit, Lord, to continue to beat upon our conscience and to guide us in the right way of living. We thank you for the holy angels, Lord, who guard our steps and to watch over us and to watch our backs and to keep us from dangers seen and unseen. Lord, we thank you tonight that we do have a hope, the hope of the soon coming of Jesus. And we pray, O oh God, that in the words of Peter, you will, you will hasten that day, Lord. You will hasten your soon coming. Tonight we are assembled, Lord, in this fashion, Lord, um, to give you thanks. And our people, Lord, our, our little group in Wellington, our members are scattered all over, Lord, in another year. And we pray for them. We pray for each home that you'll be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we pray, all of us, Lord, who constitute this little group of Wellington, we will seek to give ourselves to you unreservedly, to seek to put away sin and to perfect holiness and righteousness in the midst of an evil and adulterous world. Lord, we pray, Lord, for um, the, the struggles and the sins that you will grant us the victory that we also need over the sins that we have gotten from our parents heredit hereditarily and for the sins that we have picked up, cultivated through life, dear Lord. We pray that as we seek to establish our presence and a place for you in Wellington, that you will be with us and as we seek to resume our missionary activities, Lord, that you will pave the way and that you prepare the hearts of the people to receive even your son Jesus Christ and the truths for this time. We pray a special prayer for all those who have been with us since the COVID, Lord, who've logged on faithfully. You know them by name and by nature. You know the problems and the struggles to which they, they are succumb. But I pray by and by that they will not give up or give in, but they will continue to hold to God's unchanging hand. Remember, O oh God, our world church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, the general conference, the division, the union, the local conferences, our institutions, schools, the hospitals, Lord, um, the various branches of work, our, our, our food store, restaurants, Lord, remember, Lord, um, the call porters, the medical missionaries, the evangelists, those who are currently running meetings. I lift up my dear friend, Keith Woodard, Lord, who is at this time conducting some meetings up there in the Tampa, Jacksonville area. 
May you continue to uphold him as he preached the truth for this time. Remember, Lord, the various pastors who are assigned to the various churches, those who have multiple churches. Lord, we pray for them that as their days, so shall their strength be. And Father, we know all is not right within the church from the leadership perspective. And we pray, Lord, that those whom you have elected to lead, Lord, that they will be true. They'll be true to the Bible and the counsels given to us in the spirit of prophecy and that they will make decisions that will, Lord, bring us nearer, nearer to Jesus. Lord, we just thank you. Remember, Lord, our brothers and sisters all over the world who live in volatile areas, areas where Christianity is not the dominant religion, where they have to worship um, in obscurity. We pray for them and that you will give them the strength that they need. Lord, tonight we're assembled once more, Lord, just to, to be encouraged, uh, to be strengthened and to be chastened in the way of the Lord. I pray that you will grant me um, wisdom and, and understanding and knowledge to put forth your words tonight and that, that they may guide some soul, Lord, who are tossed to and fro on the wind seas of uncertainty. It will, it will stabilize them. They will be more firmer, more resolute to follow you comes what may. And we pray that when time on earth shall be no more, that my household and all those who have taken on the name Seventh-day Adventist will be saved in your kingdom, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I want to say a special good evening to everyone. If you've just logged on, we, you're at the right place, at the right space. You're at a safe place um, to be. And we hope and pray that you will, you will stay with us. If you've just logged on, we ask even at you, you'll copy this link. Um, let's get others involved in this evening's study. We have started a brand new series, um, um, The Trailblazers. And we are reviewing the life, the legacy, the mission of our pioneers, men and women whom God raised up, who lit a fire um, and, 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 and who burned a clear path even to the gates of heaven. Our thematic text for this series is Psalms 11 verse 3 where David says, If the foundation be destroyed, then what can the righteous do? It's very imperative for us as we build and as we seek to form or, and to forge characters that they, we will seek to build on a solid foundation and that foundation is Jesus and the truths for this time. Our thematic text as we quote as we survey the life of these men and women who have who are now resting in Jesus some are awaiting the, the call of Jesus some are awaiting the voice of God we pray that the that the fire may the fire of their devotion may it light our way Friends, we have been told over and over in this review that we are to rehearse the experience of the men who acted a part in the establishment of this work. She says the experience of William Miller and Joseph Bates and other pioneers must be kept before the people, kept before our children. We're told it is a sin to forget. It is a sin to be negligent. And if we cultivate this habit of being forgetful and being negligent, we may at last neglect the preparation needful to stand in the day of God. She says the standing bearers are falling in death and, and are to speak through the reprinting and the, of, their, of, their, of their testimonies. She says, let those who are dead speak by reprinting their articles. And so we, it's not all about doom and gloom and thunder law and mark of the beast. There are other aspects to the message. And we want to just dedicate and devote this, this, this season, this, this platform, just, just quickly looking at the lives of these men and women whom God used. And we pray that as we survey their lives that we will gleam inspiration and where they went wrong, we may not seek to follow their disobedience. The Apostle Paul we have to covet good gifts. And so we want to covet their rightful actions. So we are, ex we are examining the lives of these men and women when I say men, I do mean generic men and women. From three perspectives, we, we want to do it historically. So we're going to go as far back as we can, right? But we also want to keep it chronologically. In other words, we want to keep them in their proper sphere. Each one of our pioneers, they fell under one angel. Either they were labored under the first angel or the second angel or the third angel. And so as we go through chronologically, we're not just 
pulling pioneers out of the hats. We're keeping them in their groups in which they labored because you're going to see that their works did, did overlap. So, so historically, yes, chronologically, but we just don't want to have a head knowledge and to have a, a whole bunch of papers. We want to have heart knowledge. We are seeking to gleam an experimental knowledge whereby we have an experience, a more love for this message, a more love for Christ, a remnant church, a more love for his organization, a more love for his cause, and that the fire of their devotion will burn within us as we seek to serve Jesus wherever our lot may be, wherever providence, winds of providence may blow us. You know, on this theme called experience, friends, and I'm praying that you're not just getting information because we have been um, hijacked by information, you know what I'm saying? But we want an experience. As a matter of fact, as I thought about this experimentally, I, I, I remember the quotation in the Great Controversy, page 6 to 2, where Ms. White says, The time of trouble, such as never, is soon to open upon us, and we shall need a what? An experience or an experimental knowledge which we do not now possess. And I'm praying, friends, that through this particular series and other, and other mediums of truth that God uh, is bringing your way, that you will develop that experience, she says, which many are too indolent to obtain. You, we can get it, but we are oftentimes overcome by laziness. And she says, it is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation and reality, but it is not true for the crisis before us. Friends, we're going to have, have to have a deeper experience than which we now possess. I'm praying that this particular series will help you in that experimental walk with Jesus. Trailblazers, still blazing for the Lord, right? Now, lesson three, we've looked at William Miller in two parts. Now we're going to, we're keeping them chronological. Now friends, throughout uh, Christianity, uh, there, have, there have been, or even life, there have been some dynamic duos. Um, in the secular world and also in the spiritual world. When we think of Batman, who else do we think of? Superman? No, Nathan, Robin, right? Nathan, Superman, Nathan, you're off, all right? Batman and Robin, right? When we think of Bonnie, who else we think of? Bonnie and Clyde, the notorious, infamous, right? When we think of Starkey, we think of Arch. What about um, the Lone Ranger and who, who was his sidekick? This Indian. Yeah. yeah, I forgot his name. But you get my, you get my point, right? Not, but not just in the physical or the secular, there have been some dynamic duos in the spiritual, in, the, in, the, in spirituality, in Christianity. We think of Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Timothy, Aquila and Priscilla. We think of Caleb, we think of Joshua, and there are many others. Many others we think of Latimer and Ridley, we think of Luther, and we think of Melanchthon, and, and, and the list goes on and on. Uh, and the Bible says that two are better than one because they have a better reward for their labor. And when we think of William Miller, when we think of Adventism, when we think of the Millerite movement, the Midnight Cry, we, mo we cannot, we cannot uh, over overemphasize the legacy of this man, Joshua V. Hines. When I think of Joshua V. Hines, I think of a man who was, who was prompt, who was decisive, who, uh, who did dilly lally, a man who had pepped in his step, a man who probably he ate uh, uh, scotch bonnet pepper because he was, he was on fire for Jesus. And so tonight we're going we're gonna to survey the life of this tremendous man of God who now rests in Jesus, awaiting not the voice of God, but the voice of Jesus. Now, our handouts. Um, we're going through the dates, the date and the age and the event, right? 1906, he was born in Wickford, Rhode Island, right? And um, again, we're filling, there, there are some gaps, but we want to hit the high points of the life of Joshua V. Hines, right? In 1821, he was 16, and he was apprentice until 1825, so four years to William Knights. And William Knight was a, a Unitarian cabinet maker, right? And he attended with Knight's church in Massachusetts, 
but he could not bring himself to accept the Unitarian beliefs which negated the teachings of Jesus and his disciples. And you must understand that during that dispensation, um, deism was for the skeptics and Unitarianism was, um, you know, was the prominent, one of the prominent religious beliefs. And the Unitarian back then did not appreciate or, um, you know, receive Christ and his apostles, the disciples' teaching. So young Himes in his um, 16, age, age 16, did not feel that the Lord was calling him, right, to that congregation. And then he starts to attend the first Christian church. In 1823, at age number 18, he is baptized and licensed as, a, as an exhorter in the first Christian church. You know, back in those days, it was almost a crime, a, mo a mortal crime, to go forth with any church and not be licensed. You were liable. You know, today, if a man comes in your house to do work, you know, contractors has to be licensed. It's against the law for you to do mechanical, well, you know, electrical work and construction work without being licensed. And so back then, society placed a heavy emphasis on ministers being licensed by their local denomination. Today, it's not necessarily so, right? Now, at age, in 1826, at age 21, he married Mrs. Mary Thompson Handy, and through their union, they eventually had nine boys. So, boy, he had his quiver, <laughs> had his quiver full of them, a whole bunch of nappies, right? And maybe sleepless nights, right? So, through that time frame, right? Now, at age, in 1827, at age 22, he is now fully ordained to ministry. Um, the church sees his, 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 his gifts and they now ordain him to be a full-fledged minister. In 1830, now age 25, he is called to Boston, Massachusetts. Remember, you must understand that when we look at Adventism, you look at the Northeast, right? Those northern states. Remember, remember the Revelation 7, the angel came from the east. So Adventism really got birth in the northern east hemisphere of this great country right now so in age 1830 at age 25 he's called to boston massachusetts the first christian church starting with seven families so he's basically given a little church to kind of prove if god has called you know they told me back in the regional work when the regional work the black work got started you know it wasn't so much you leave in school that affirmed your calling um you had to prove your worth so they would send you off into what is called a dark county. They'll give you a little stipend and say, hey, six months, make something out of nothing. Let the barren place rejoice and the wilderness become fruitful. Today, it's a, it's a, it's a different thing. And I think if, if, if it was done that way today, it, will, it would have kept out unwarranted people whom God hasn't called. Today, what is it that vindicates your call? One goes to Bokud or Southern and gets a degree and M. Dave and voila, we are here. And some of these guys, they don't want to leave and, and they don't want to birth something. They want to inhabit mega churches and this lights, camera, action. But back then, he had to prove his worth, prove his salt. And so he was given seven families. Now, seven families, if you look in what's a nucleus, that's probably two sevens, 14, 14, 15 people with children, right? And, but within two years, he, uh, um, he had the chapel filled. So definitely you can see that this man was not someone who got up and went. He was called. And his calling was vindicated by him, you know, building a congregation up. But he was a reformer. And, and, and you must understand back then, p these ministers were very, very active. It's not like today we're just in our own little myoptic shell you know, it's just us four and no more. These ministers were very, were very active in social causes. Um, some of the causes that he, he espoused very dearly, Joshua V. Himes, and we're making our way to the 1831. We're still, we're getting there, right? Um, he was an abolitionist. Who was an abolitionist? Anti-slavery. Himes was, uh, uh, was a good friend of the staunch supporter of William Lloyd Garrison. Who was he? Look him up. One of the avid anti slavery uh, abolitionist in, in, in America, right? And his church donated $14, which is a, a good sum of money, um, you know, 
in 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 1833 seen you could this could $14 could buy you three fourths 12 could buy you four slaves three slaves you know that, that, that's that's pretty good good money so for that time right 1833 to the abolitionist um, newspaper which was the official organ for the anti-slavery movement so this paper would oftentimes keep um, people in the north up to date as what was going on in the anti um, ab abolitionist movement, right? He was also a part of the non resistance, a pacifist society. What was that? This meant that they did not believe in bearing arms. <laughs> Are you going to win a war, <laughs> right? But, you know, and the, as Adventists, you know, we do take a non combatant stand in, in, arm, in the army. You can join the army, but we don't, you know, really support you bearing arms uh, and so forth, right? And, right? Then he also was a, um, you can serve, but you cannot go in there and shoot. You can serve as a nurse, as a <laughs> driving the trucks, but we do not encourage you to bear arms, right? He was also a elected director from the radical, uh, the woman's rights. He believed that women um, had the rights um, and that th their rights were suppressed. And there were movements at that time known as the suffrage movement, um, you know, um, that really tried to bring back women to some kind of civility, um, the right just to be a woman, the right just to, you know, to open a bank account, the right just to vote, you know. And so he definitely supported that. So you can see where this man was. He wasn't just a preacher in the pulpit pontificating on Sunday. He was very active in the community, right? Uh, also, he, this was one of the earliest, one of the earliest um, calls that he, that he espoused. He espoused education. Uh, he supported the boys' trade schools of the Cherry Farm Hill, where boys could earn and learn at the same time. So he was definitely one who believed that young people should be taught skills that would help them to go through life. And he was also an avid advocate of the temperance movement. He served and he traveled on lectures. And back then, temperance for them was what? Um, tobacco, liquor. I don't think they were promoting vegetarianism, right? But just the things that really were very detrimental to um, health. So you can see he was not just, again, just a clergy on Sunday. He was very active um, in the causes of humanity. And friends, we say that, you know, a church should not just be there. We should be very active in the community to see what we can do to help stay the tide that is eroding society. Note. As a result of his activities, you know, friends, the, the, the problem you're going to get is never from the world. It's always from the church. And you're going to find now, subsequently, a group of church members became dissatisfied with his pastoral work, um, right? Considering him too radical and progressive of a pastor. And so they made calls. They sent telegrams. I'm about to say they made phone calls. They were in phone calls back then. But in 1837, they, trans they, they informed Himes that they, he wished... That, that, that they wished him to, to hire as another pastor in another place. So, Himes was moving on, right? Now, we're moving down now to where he is now establishing himself. In 1837 now, right? He is 32, and he decides to establish the Clar Charendon Street Christian Church, right? A number of members of the first Christian church went with him. They purchased a property and built the, the Charendon Church, Street Church, which would hold, which, which could hold 500, it was soon filled because he was a very dynamic, you know, speaker, energetic, and his causes gravitated the people and became famous as a site of some of the most radical reform conventions of that time. This man was a radical, and nothing is wrong with being radical. Nothing is wrong with being radical as long as you're radically right. You know, and your radicalness is tempered with tact and love and all things and everything must be considered. Now, at age 34, he now has a rendezvous with Miller. By this time, William Miller is about 50, in his 50s, somebody I think 57, right? Miller begins to lecture at the Charendon. He actually invites Miller to lecture at his church. Now, he had met um, Miller earlier in New Hampshire, in Exeter, New Hampshire, but he finally now invites Miller to come and lecture at his church. Now, this is what Vime, um, Haim says now, right? Please read. These lectures were? 
These were Miller's first lectures in a major city, given twice a day. Now remember, prior to this, Miller was still just going around the country. He was not um, infamous, famous, right? Just a farmer doing his thing. But this was his first major lecture in a major city, right? Now, please read now. The interest was so great, hundreds had to be turned away. Wow. After Miller's lectures, Himes met with Miller and joined him in the cause as its prime mover, opening doors to other Christian churches in the large cities, and editing and publishing. F.D. Nicoll described his method as action and on a large scale and without delay. So this man didn't just have a, uh, a tunnel view. This man had a, you know, he believed, you know, we oftentimes quote that quote by, by um, William Carey, expect great things from God and then we do what? We attempt great things from God. This man believed that he served a big God and um, William Miller needed a bigger platform. And so Joshua Hine, who was almost like the slingshot, the bingy, the catapult that launched the Millerite movement. And today we are a recipient of what Joshua V. Himes did. Now, after um, Miller spoke at his church, Joshua V. Himes sat down and he had a very intimate conversation with, dialogue with Miller. And I want you to get the tenor of where Himes' mind is. Young Himes in his 30s, Miller in his 50s, right? To see where... So he begins to pick Miller's mind. And look what he asks now, Miller. Quote now, do you? Do you really believe this doctrine? Here is, come on, Miller. Are you, are, do you really believe this? Right, go ahead now. The question seemed to reverberate through the dimly lit drawing room as the two men faced each other. The younger of the two, eagerly searching for a cause in which to spend his radical energy and remarkable talents, mm. addressed the elder, an honest farmer and avid Bible student, mm -hmm. whose lectures on Christ's soon coming were beginning to shake the world. So here was a young, a young man. This man, full of energy and synergy. This man was drinking the, the what do you call it now, the Red Bull of his day, spiritually, right? A lot of energy. And he wanted a cause. To, to put this energy and synergy in. And brothers and sisters, there may be somebody watching now that there's a fire in you, that, that you, 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 you want something to, to live for. Let me tell you something. The Adventist message is that cause. And God is looking for workers. Begin where you are. Ask the good Lord, I'm telling you, to create a platform whereby you can work and burn for Jesus. Right? So here we see now the younger... Uh, uh, had energy, he addressed the, the elder, honest farmer, and an avid, remember Miller, Miller knew his Bible, man, student. He was more Bible-versed than, 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 than most of the pioneers in those days, right? And as they conversed, he wanted Miller to shake the world. Now, look what Miller responded now. He said, I what? I certainly do, or I would not preach it, uh -huh. Miller affirmed. Well then, urged Joshua Himes, what are you doing to spread it throughout the world? And remember, the reason why William Miller was able to reach the heart because William Miller believed what he preached. And Mrs. Spurgeon said, you know, it, uh, it is very hard for you to convince a man of a truth that you yourselves don't really believe. Do you really believe that the Adventist church is God's last church of Bible prophecy? Do you believe that we have been given a message second and friends? If you do not believe that, then you will never convince someone else. And the reason why Miller was able to capture the mind of young Himes and Hunter because William Miller believed what it, therefore now, you, what are you doing, he said, to take this thing to the world? You need to go viral. Please read now for eight years. For eight years, Miller had been going mostly to small towns. All right. He had done all he could and had no way to progress any faster in spite of the urgency of his message. All right. Well, charge times, uh -huh. if Christ is to come in a few years as you believe, no time should be lost in giving the church and the world warning in thunder tones to arouse them to prepare. Ooh, for you see what his mind is? This man is, this man is, listen, he is taking all that, that radicalism from the, uh, um, the abolitionist, from the pacifist, from, you know, from the education, the woman's right. He has now found a cause in which he's going to, he's going to dive heading now. You know, brothers and sisters, you know, when you go, I've had friends, kid you not, who have 
they tell you go in the river. You never dive because the rocks down there, right? You may, but this man dived in head first, right? Not just that. Now, what can an old farmer do? Please read now. What can an old farmer do? Mm -hmm. Miller defended himself and pled, no one as yet seems to enter into the object and spirit of my mission. In other words, I'm just alone. It's just me, myself, and I doing the best I can. A 50-year-old man, you know what I'm saying, going around in my cart, doing the best I can. But God hasn't given me someone who can share my vision, right? Or who has the know-how to do it. Please read now. So as to render me aid. Uh-huh. I have been looking for help. Mm. I want help. Yes. Then Father Miller challenged times excitedly. Wow. You see how God is working now? God is now linking people up. And friends, I believe right now, God is linking people up. God is allowing ministries to cross paths. He's allowing clergy and laity to put away their differences. And people are working together for the common good, brothers and sisters, to get this work out. He goes on to say, prepare what? Prepare for the campaign. Yes. For the doors shall be open uh -huh. in every city, in the union. What a man of and faith, right? Prepare for the campaign. I am said it, right? Please read now. And the warning shall go to the ends of the earth. Wow. Because of this conversation and his conviction that the Advent message was truth, Himes dedicated himself, uh -huh. his family, and all he had Ooh, upon the altar friends, of at God. Tonight, let me ask you, where is your family in this thing? You know, we're all reading the same book, but we need to be all on the same page. And the problem we have in some homes, we're reading the same book. Yeah, nobody dis dis discredit the Bible. But sometimes we are not on all on the same page, the same page of urgency. His family, right? Himself, himself, and all he had upon the altar. Where is your finances? Where is your 401k? Where are your retirement? Where are your houses? Are your houses being used when you draw these rent to fund the cause of God? Yes, we could not, we should not neglect our families, but friends, we have a greater cause to give aid to and assistance. And this was the secret to Heim's success, himself, his family, and all he had upon the altar, and God honored V. Himes. Now, 1840 now, he's 30. Immediately now, what does he do now? He goes into overdrive. This man, he forgets first gear, he jumps into fifth gear. He begins publishing Signs of the Times, a periodical. On March 20th in Boston, calls for the first general conference of Adventists, not Seventh-day Adventists, of Adventists, one who believes in Christ's second coming, which was held in October 4th. So, so he now begins to organize all the Adventists coming together. In 1842 now, watch it now, right? He published two collections, he published two hymns and Miller's lectures, right? Which convinced who? Joseph Bates and Charles Fitch to other message. So we're going to cover these pioneers. So these were other men who were out there looking, but thanks through the, 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 the ingenuity of putting Miller's lectures to paper, it now catches the attention of Joseph Bates. We're going to cover Joseph Bates, you know, in a few lectures and Charles Fitch. These men were one to the cause, not so much by preaching, but by literature friends do not underestimate the book you're giving out don't underestimate the tracks you're giving out let's not underestimate the publishing work and i appeal to you you call harvest time books you buy the great controversies you get ministry of, you get these books brothers and sisters and you start you, you, you put your put a number in them or put a website in them and you give these books out as the lord opens door right now now, we're still in age, um, 1842 now. Remember, we're two year, one year of 1843, the first is appointment, and we're also two years shy of 1844. In 1842, January, February, March, January, February, March, April, May, he's 37, at the Conference of Believers now, was voted to schedule several camp meetings. Friends, before this, this was never heard of. Hines was the one who said, listen, we need to have camp meetings where we... We meet and we camp out in tents, right? And we encourage the brethren. And today, of course, you know, we have camp meetings, which we've kind of moved far from the original camp meetings 
you know, they are, you know, original blueprint. But the point is, Himes, these were the men who birthed what we today call camp meetings. As a matter of fact, um, in um, um, 1842, June 28, he's 37. Look what happened now when, please read now, as Himes now begin to orchestrate these camp meetings and tents. Please read now. This was... This was the first camp meeting held at East Kingston, New Hampshire. Attendance stopped at ten to 15,000, wow. including John Greenleaf Whittier. Who was he? Look him up. He was the great American poet. And he was, man, this man, and you can still find his works today. And he even wrote on the experience of what he saw under the tent. Right? Please read now. Decision to purchase a large tent for future camp meetings. 120 feet diameter, center pole 55 feet, which was the largest in the country, yes. seating 4,000 people. This man was big. And I'm telling you, friends, we've got to learn ways in which we can make this message go larger. Now, friends, we're not going to go outside the realms of counsel because God has given us counsel. But friends, too many of us, we are stuck in this little pinhole religion. You got to think big. We serve a big God, right? There is a thing we learned called holy, holy ingenuity. Ask God to inspire you. This was inspiration, right? Please read now. Set up. Set up at Concord, New Hampshire on July 27th 1st and another eight times by November 3rd. About 500,000 people attended 125 camp meetings between 1842 and October of 1844. Friends, where is this power? Where is this power in your ministry? I'm talking to a pastor right now. I'm talking to a head editor. I'm talking to somebody. Where this energy, you need this energy. We need this energy to be able to attract people to Jesus and to this one. Friend. Look at the camp meeting. There were people... This was, this was some serious crowds. They never had YouTube. And I'm going to tell you something. If you think that God is dependent upon YouTube to finish the work, think again. By and by, YouTube is getting tighter. Certain things you cannot say. Listen, when I joined YouTube, you could, you know, put a song before your, your sermon and it's an introduction and you weren't, you weren't flagged. Today, even before the song goes up, YouTube already... Copy written, copy claim. So it's, it's, YouTube is getting more smart. And you're going to find sooner very soon, you'll be penalized for saying this and saying that. And so God is not so much de dependent upon a social media. What the work is dependent upon is the Holy Spirit working and moving upon the hearts of people on a global scale. Right now, before the first appointment, he made this observation. Now, when you look at Himes, Himes was still not date-ish. The event, yes. But he, I remember we learned the last week that Miller only accepted 1844, eight days before it came to pass. So Miller and Himes were still cautious about the date, but not the event. Now, before the first appointment in 1843, March, he made this observation, right? He says, if we are mistaken on the time, what is he saying? The date. And the world still goes on after 1843. Remember, right? We shall have the satisfaction of having done our duty. Our, so he's saying, listen, if, if 1844 43 comes and nothing happens, he says, we have done our duty. He says now, our publications are evangelical. They have and are now producing the most salutary effect upon the church and the world. This movement, Lisa, was a global movement. You've got to think big. Think global in your, in, 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 in your work for Jesus. Not just in your neighborhood. Think, but in order to think global, you have to begin where you are. Right? He says, our lectures and public meetings produce the same glorious results. Can we ever forget that souls were converted, that the virgins were awakened and prepared to meet the Lord? If then we are mistaken about the time, what harm can result to the church and the world? So, you know, he says, if the timing is right, the world and the churches are no worse. Friends, you know, I've come to realize that this, war, this Christianity is all about faith. And you'll find a whole lot of people who, who don't believe in this heavenly, heavenly mansion and harp and all that stuff. And sometimes you hang around them and you hear them talk. 
you begin to question, you know, you know, and I say to myself, I've oftentimes tell folks this, as I'm in interaction with people who are not of my persuasion, people who are more worldly, I'll say, listen, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And if there was no heaven, no God, no Bible, no reward, the life that I have chosen to live is still, be, is still the best life. I, I don't regret it. And I would live it all over again. You see, friends? So he's saying, if 1843 comes and goes, we are no loser based on the, based on the date, but the event is sure, and the world it has not been made worse by our publication. Look what he says now. He says, our work is one of the unutterable magnitude. Do we still believe that the message for this time is of an utter magnitude? He says it is a mission, an enterprise, unlike in some respects any, uh, anything that has ever awakened the energies of man. It is, not a subs it is not a subserviency to human institutions. It is not a conflict on the political arena. He says, listen, we're not political. We're not fighting against politics. You know, we're not here beating up governments. That's not what we're here for. We're not here attacking presidents and everything the president does, it's a highlight. No, that's not what we're called to do. And, and we're cautioned in our work not to attack governments, not to be antagonistic. Look what he says now. But it, it is not an operation uh, of a distinct religious sect, but it is an alarm. An alarm to do what? To wake people up. He says, and a cry uttered by those who form among all Protestant sect are as watchmen standing upon the walls of the world, walls of upon, standing upon the walls of, of a moral world, believe the world's crisis is come, and who under the influence of this faith are united in proclaiming the world. This was what this man believed. He, goes, he says, now behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. It is an enterprise that swallows up all the pity peculiarities of sectarianism and unites us upon an elevation so far above those uh, ministries on dilutation that they have utterly lost over the view below, etc., etc. Friends, this man believed that this movement was an alarm. And friends, when I think of this, I, I, friends, I tell you, we are an alarm, not an alarmist, <laughs> but we're an alarm to wake people up. It's a cry. We are watchmen on the worlds of the moral, moral walls of the world, right? So this was V. Himes. Now, in 1843 now, 1844, we're in January, February, March. The first disappointment has gone 1843. So we're in January, February, March of 1844. March first disappointment has gone now as he's reflecting now on the disappointment he makes a profound statement about prophecy and look what he says now please read now as for prophecy as far as prophecy in connection with history presents evidence that may point to any particular time it is our duty to consider it faithfully but we have no right to be dogmatical respecting it and we should consider how fallible we are mm -hmm. and how liable we are to be deceived. There it is. He's, re he's reflecting on 1843, right? Please read now. We should therefore so live that we may be prepared for the earliest appearing of our Lord mm -hmm. and yet also so manage our affairs in connection with the business of life that we may occupy till he come. So you find now that there is a, sh there's, there's a shift in his mind. And he hasn't lost faith in prophecy, but what he has lost faith in now, in certain dates. And that's why he says now, he says how fallible we are. And then he now begins to, 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 to he shifts in his, in, his, in, his, in his heavens, in his realms, from this prophetic uh, future, future, and he now transitions to the day. He says what? So live that we may be prepared for his earliest appearance. Take it day by day. I know the end is coming here, but friends, we must also live in the present. And you can never prepare for the end if you neglect the present. He says now, yet also manage our affairs 
The Bible says we ought to occupy till he comes. So while we're in this world, right, we're not going to neg neg neglect day to day duties. We're going to be faithful stewards, faithful in the business that, that we have to handle as we go through life. We're going to occupy until Christ come. And let so, let, so not, let not so much be focused on events. Because you can die before the event. Let's now live in the present. Let's live as this day was our last. There has been a shift in his mind. Now remember now, at this time, 1843 came and, came and gone, Himes is now pressured and Miller. Remember, Miller accepted the date, 1844, just, what, six days or eight days before 1844. So he was very weary of certain dates. Himes also, he didn't really want to embrace October 1844, but because of pressure, Lizzie, he, 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 he ate in October the 8th, 18, the 8th month, which is what now? What month is that? August? August! He accepted the midnight cry, pour into October 22nd. So he's still leery, right? In 1844, uh, the 1039, he experienced the great disappointment a second time. Now, friends, you would have thought after two disappointments, uh, this man's faith would have been shaken. And, and we're going to show you that this disappointment, people wept as how they wept for their dying child. This was a serious, where 500,000 people came down to 50. That's, that, that's 1% one of 1% one of 1%. Literally, out of that 50, the Adventist church was, was, was birth. Right? So while he's dis discouraged now, William Miller, his senior, writes him a letter. And this letter is so moving. And a song was birthed by, out of this letter. Tell me if you can put the song in the, in the chat group. Tell me if you know the song after I wrote. So Miller's now writing to kind of encourage um, V. Himes. He said now, although I, Miller to Himes now, although I have been twice disappointed. Why twice? March 1843 and October 26, 1844. He says now, I am not yet cast down or discouraged, brothers and sisters. You know what I'm telling you? Something? People will disappoint you. People will fail you. The church will let you down. But let us not become discouraged and lose hope and lose faith in the church irregardless of what is happening around us or what you see or the wrongs being done. Don't let that shake your faith. Look what he says now. I have fixed my mind upon another time and here I mean to stand until God gives me more light. That is, today, 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 until he comes and here, and, and, and I see him for whom my soul yearns. What song was birthed out of this? I have set my mind on another time, on another time. And here I mean to stay until God gives me more light. And that is today, today, today until he comes. I'm butchering the song, but you get the point, right? Wow. And by the way, the man who wrote that song, you need to research how he came upon that lyrics. Who would have thought of that, huh? Taking a man's letter his experience, and putting melodies to it. And friends, you see, oftentimes we think of good music, we want to reach out to the evangelicals and sing their mantras, but they are, they are, they are, they are, they are rich experience within our history. Where if we are led by the Spirit, we can pull forth and become uh, as, as a, 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 another building, the sweet uh, Psalms of, of Israel, right? So, so at... Um, at age number 30, right, 39, he experienced a disappointment. Now, for the next um, 39, 40, for the next 30 years, obviously the, the, the Millerite movement dies out. It fades out. And Himes is now, he's just bouncing around. You know, he's bouncing around and he's trying to find himself. He joins this church, you know. And by the way, 
1844 produced three groups of people. There were those who gave up the movement. They quit. They quit the movement. There were those who actually went back to their various churches. And there were those who kept pace with the light. And so Haim didn't really keep pace with the light. Haim was kind of disillusioned after a while, trying to find himself, bouncing around Lizzie after all. You know, Millerite movement, Miller, Miller had passed off the scene. And, you know, he was kind of by himself. Um, you know, just kind of, you know, I was, I was watching this, this documentary. And um, it's called... It's okay to not be okay. And it's a documentary on the Olympians. After they have finished with the Olympics, what do they do? And the suicide rate is so high in Olympia because they have trained all their lives on meager salaries, meager stipends. And they train, they train, they train, they train, they train for a few seconds and they go and listen. If you don't get the gold, there's no contract, no Wheaties, none of that stuff. Nobody knows you. And so you're watching the documentary and there, there's several of them. Michael Phelps is in it and, and some of these skiers and, 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 and athletes and, and um, ice skaters. And, and you'll be surprised that after the Olympics, they just fade out as nobody. They're walking the streets and nobody knows who they are. Oh, no, they, they, literally. And it becomes a very lonely world because you, your life has been so disciplined on a regiment. When that is over, the US Olympic team kick you to this. Literally, to the, you're on your own. And so it becomes a very lonely world, right? Some move on with their lives. Others never find themselves. Some commit suicide. So after 1844, this man who was an organizer, full of energy, you know what I mean? He just fades off the scene as if. And so he becomes disillusioned, not crazy, but he's here, Lizzie, there, trying to find himself. And finally, in 1875 now, Miller passed off the scene. He's 70 years old. Guess what he does now? He rejoined, or he joined, rejoined the Episcopal Church, which was a church of his his, his parents. And he died an Episcopal. He died, an, he died an Episcopal priest, you know. He went back. But one of the things you, 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 you know about V. Himes, he never really lost faith in, in what he did and the movement. Now, all of a sudden, in 1895, 20 years later, he's still alive, you know. Remember, Miller died at 69, Right? Himes is 70. So Himes have gone over three score and 10 by the reason of strength. Now, at age 90, Joshua V. Himes is still alive. Wow. And not just alive, God now allows him at age in 1880, 1895, he's 90. Look what happens to Himes now. Himes becomes a patient of D.H. Cress, M.D. at Battle Creek Sanitarium, right? This is D.M. Crest. Now, D.M. Crest, we're going to talk about him in later studies, but he was one of the most, he was one of the pioneers who saw Ellen White envision the most. Medical doctor. He was able to examine her. She didn't breathe. Her eyes were open. Strength. He saw this. So, V. Himes goes to the sanitarium to, to, to get worked on, and he, he bumps into Dr. Cress, right? And... As he's leaving Battle Creek now to go home, he is on a train, and guess who's on the same train? John Lofberg, one of the one of the more modern pioneers, right? On the Third Angel, right? And so now V. Himes begins to have a, a conversation with Joshua V. Himes, with, with Lofberg, and he also has a conversation with Cress. Now, Dr. Cress now said this. As he dialogued with Himes at the sanitarium, look what, look what was Crest's uh, 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 assessment of Himes as they dialogue. Remember, he's 90 years old. 90 years old man to, in today's society, full of Alzheimer's. Don't know if he's coming or going. 90 year old a day, using the shakes. You got some serious shakes. But look at this man's mind now, right? 
Please read now. Himes to Crest now. Uh -huh. Quoting. God accomplished the purpose of the message he gave to us. Yes. And when our work was done, the Seventh-day Adventists were raised up to carry the work forward to completion mm. in calling the people in all the world to move forward into the eternal land of promise. So Himes recognized that the Adventist church was a God move. It's almost like a Batania. We, and remember, when you run a relay, who are the two most important people, positions to, to secure? Where do, you, where, where do you path, Ali? For the two fastest. The one who starts and the one who ends, right? So guess what? The Millerites gave us, they were pretty fast. And so now, we've gotten the final battalion. So he realized that the Adventist church really picked up where the Millerite movement left off, right? As we wind down now, he and Joshua V. Himes had a conversation. And look what, he and Lofbird, pardon me, had a conversation. Look what Lofbird assessment of Himes was. At, at, at um, 90. Please read now. Of one thing he was thankful, he had never opposed the work of Mrs. E.G. White. Wow, so he never used his writings to oppose Ellen White's work. And thank God because he was still a good, a good writer and he had influence, right? Because at that time, visions were skeptical. We don't want no kind of vision. This woman falling out, this girl is crazy, right? And many wrote negatively about her, right? Please read now. That was doubtless with the remembrance of the fact that many of the first day Adventists of the former movement had made that gift the special object of attack. So at that time frame, they were attacking the spirit of prophecy left, right, and friends. Isn't that, isn't it ironic? Nothing has changed as in the beginning, so in the end. As the work was starting, there was some venomous, malignous attack of the spirit of prophecy. And in the end today, we're attacking it from a different perspective and I've learned, and the attacks are coming not so much from without, but from within. And you don't have to despise a thing to hate it, says C.D. Brooks. Just fail to give it preeminence. Right? Now, question number one now. Only one question now. In her reflection of the Millerite movement, what was Ellen White's honest assessment of it? As she surveyed the life of Miller, Lich, Lukanzi, ben Rabbi Ben-Ezra, Wolf, Himes, the movers and shakers, right? What was her honest assessment of, and when she's, when she's assessing the Millerite movement, she's also assessing the life of Joshua V. Himes. In early writings, Ellen White now is reflecting on the Millerite movement. And friends, I'm going to tell you something. This is powerful. This is such a powerful assessment, an honest assessment. Look at the word she chooses now. This is from early writings, page 258. She says, please read now, of all... Of all the great religious movements since the days of the apostles. Stop there. So she's summarizing now all the great moves of movements, religious, from the apostles to her time. That includes the Reformation. That includes the Enlightenment. That includes the Great Awakening. As she's assessing all of them. She can say this without unequivocally. Look what she says now. What? None mm. have been more free from human imperfection and the wiles of Satan than was that of the autumn of 1844. That is serious, you know. She says of all the great movements that have traversed, and there are some serious movements, she says none was more free from what? Human what? And what? The wiles of, than what? Than the author, so this was a this was a God move. This was a move. This, um, this movement was Holy Ghost lit. Please read now. Even now, even now, after the lapse of nearly half a century, all who shared in that movement and who have stood firm upon the platform of truth still feel the holy influence of that blessed work wow. and bear witness that it was of God. Mm. The work did not stand in the wisdom and yeah. learning of men, yes. but in the power of God. Friends, and the problem we have today, there's too many humans standing in the work. Our human ingenuity, it's too much degrees, too much academia, we plan, we plan, we plan, we meet, we meet, we meet, and don't work. This was purely high-grade, unfiltered, organic Holy Ghost. This movement was so powerful that they almost 
Did you know that America was considering canceling the election of 1844, Lizzie? Because they felt that the world was coming to an end. Could you imagine? Could you imagine that the, one of the biggest elections that ever took, took place, the most controversial, that drew out the most vote was the one that we had a few months ago? Could you imagine that that, that was on the verge of being postponed? Trump said, hold on. I may not want to run because the world may come to an end. That was the effect that the movement had. Right? Now, please read it. It was not off. It was not the most talented, but the most humble and devoted who were the first to hear and obey the wow. call. Wow. So it's not talent or diplomacy, not diplomacy, academia. It was more humility. And it was a movement that was free. I'm going to tell you something. The next movement that will eclipse this will be what? In the future. Revelation 18 verse 1, the loud cry. That would be pure Holy Ghost. We're told human machinery will be swept out of the way. It will be, be a God move. Now, this man just won't die. Right? In the first 1855 now, 1895, right? The first January the 17th, he's 90. Look what this man does now. He sends $40 to Australia to Ellen White to assist the work. Remember, the church has sent her to Australia to shut her up. Go over there. And Himes realized that she's in Australia and he sends her, he sends her $40. And Ellen White, when she received the money, she was so grateful. She took her pen and she penned one of the most gracious letters I have ever read of the assessment of a man's life at age 90 this man is his mind is still man he won't die he's still clicking and he still remembers the call he, he really believed that the Adventist church picked up where he left off and when Ellen White received the 40 bucks $40 now. Look what she wrote the letter to him now. She said, please don't just have behind. Uh -huh. My brother in Christ Jesus. No, sorry. Ella, Ella JVM. Ella. Elder J.V. Hines. So she addressed him now, right? Uh huh. My brother in Christ Jesus. Here it is now. I received your donation of forty dollars mm -hmm. in the name of our Redeemer. I thank you. Amen. Be assured, we shall invest this money in the best possible way to accomplish the most good for the salvation of souls. Yes. The spirited participation evidenced by your donation for this field has rejoiced my heart. There it is now. He was still participating even though he could not physically be there. Please read now. For it testifies that you have not lost the missionary spirit. Friends, have you lost your missionary spirit? I'm telling you, friends, the way you spend your money can dictate your love for Jesus. Have you lost your missionary spirit? It's true. We cannot go someplace, but our money can. Our money can. Please read now. Which prompted you first to give yourself to the work mm -hmm. and then to give your means to the Lord. Wow, so here it is now. You know, and too many of us, we tend to err on the, um, the uh, give, your, give, your, give your means. We, we fall in the latter. We, we're quick to write a check, and that's noble, to support this ministry, to support this cause, cash up, and so forth. But have you given yourself to the Lord? I read a story about a king who had, who had come to um, this, this, his, inherit his kingdom. And the people were all excited. And people became, you know, when, 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 when a, new, a, a new king is crowned, everybody wants to make a new show because, after all, we want to get the perks. And so this first Lord came and he brought gold, chest of gold. And he says, King, I beseech thee, take these. King said, thank you. The second brought diamonds and precious stones. And the king said, thank you. And an old lady came in, one of the poorest, from one of the poorest providence. And she said, King, all I can give you is myself. Wow. That gift outweighed all the other gifts. Friends, you know what God wants tonight? 
He wants your heart. Give yourself to God. Too many of us, we are giving money and think that the means that we give, we support Adra and ministries and that, we think that will compensate in you being negligent in giving. Listen, the latter will not compensate for the former. The man first, he said, what she said now, he testifies, you have a lost image spirit which prompted you to first give yourself to the work and then give your means to the Lord to proclaim what? The first and the what? Second, so we see the time frame that the Millerite movement did proclaim the first and the second. And based on this, she says now, angels' messages in their time and their order, he never proclaimed the third. He never died under the third. And that's why Charles Fitch, not Charles Fitch, V. Himes, like Miller, will not come up at the voice of God. They died under the first and the second. And he never accepted, he never accepted the Sabbath. But he died in the hope of Jesus' soon return. But he never came over and embraced the third angel. He ran his race. He ran his race, right? Please read now. This is a great... This is a great gratification to me, uh -huh. for it bears an honorable testimony that your heart is still in the work. 90 years old, his heart is... Is your heart still in the work? Have you lost heart? Have you lost hope? Have you lost faith in this message? Let me tell you something. God is going to use you and I to finish the work. Let's not lose heart tonight. Let's not lose faith. Right? Please read now. I see the proof of your love to the Lord Jesus Christ in your free will offering for this region. Wow. Beyond. Friends, I want to encourage you. You know, in your giving, don't forget there are several ministries out there that are doing a tremendous job. A lot of lay people, self-support ministries, medical missionaries, Bible workers. Once you've returned your tithe and offering, remember the free will offering. Remember this ministry who is seeking to put forth truth and light in these last years, right? She says, I what? I thank God. Again, I thank you for your generous contribution. Wow. In the midnight cry, as I close, you know, there are, there, there, there are two letters that, that were very dear to Joshua V. Hines that he kept in his possession until the day he died. It was a letter Miller wrote him in the early part of their ministry, so profound. He always kept that with him. And the second I'm going to show you, right? Miller wrote him this in, in 1832, and he kept this in his possession. Miller said to Hines, I would therefore advise you to lead your hearers by a slow and a sure step to Jesus Christ. I say slow because I expect they are not strong enough to run it. And where your hearers are not well what? Doctrinated. You must preach Bible. You must prove all things by Bible. You must talk Bible. You must exhort Bible. You must pray Bible. You must love Bible. And do all in your powers to make others love Bible too. Friends, he treasured that. And until the day he died, he kept that in his possession. In the seventh month, 27th date, he died in Suffolk Falls, South Dakota. 90 years old. A few months after, he sent Ellen White the money and she gave him a letter. When he died in Battle Creek, the nurse that was attending him, right, sanitarium, right, she was with him in the dying hours of his, the last hours of his life. And when he passed, she wrote, she, she notified Ellen White um, through letter. And this is what she told Ellen White about Joshua V. Hines. Please run at the Battle Creek. The Battle Creek sanitarium nurse, Mrs. Austin, who attended Himes at the sanitarium and reported his death, wrote to Ellen White that he treasured dearly her letter and often said that the work being done by Seventh-day Adventists was but the continuation of the work he and Father Miller, Miller had begun. Look what he said now. Love this. And if he were 25 years younger, he would take hold with the Seventh-day Adventist church and do what he could do. Friend, let me tell you something. You know, when I was baptized, 
I joined this church pretty young, a young man. And I did wander away from the Lord for a little bit. But thank God I was able to take hold of this message. The Bible says it is, it is good for a man to bear his yoke in his youth. And friends, you know, I, when I was young, you know, I loved to play soccer, football. I was a very good player. You know, I got recruited and so forth. And I, I had vowed. I had, I had told myself, I am going to, if I don't make it pro, I am going to die trying. My heart, I, I had resolved that my heart was going to rupture on the football field. You know, ever since I've joined the church, I have taken, I have not lost my fervor and my zeal. But friends, by the grace of God, I plan to go out with a bang for Jesus. I plan to give myself to the Lord anew and to work while it is day and to do what I can to advance the work, the cause of God in this generation as long as he lendeth me breath. I pray that we will take a page from the life of Mr. Himes, his energy, his synergy, his, 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 his faith, his big vision of things, and work while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can work. I pray that the fervor and the devotion of Mr. Himes will light your way. Father in heaven, we thank you, O God, for the life of Joshua B. Himes, a man who, if he had put his mind to anything secular, could have made millions and died a rich sinner. But Lord, he gave himself to you unreservedly. We thank you, Lord, for the foundation he laid with, along with, with Miller, and that even we today are an outgrowth of the work of Mr. Himes. As he now sleeps in Jesus, awaiting the call, I pray that the battalion now that has been passed to us, that we will go out with a blaze of glory, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, if we don't have any questions, any concerns, well, friends, listen, I hope and pray that you were blessed by tonight's study. Um, listen, it only gets better from here. This is not cunning divine fables we're following. These are live people who lived real lives. And as we study their lives, I'm praying that we will not just go chronologically and historically, but we will get that experience that which we so need which many of us are too indolent to obtain. Until then, friends, I pray that God gives you a good night's rest, strength to take on tomorrow's challenges. And in the words of the Patriot Job, I say, behold, the eye forward. <laughs>